Welcome to My Life, Chassidah Supplied, episode 475. Afrei Lechem This is a special Israel at War edition where we continue discussing these crucial events happening in our Holy Land, around the Holy Land, Promised Land, with our holy soldiers and brothers and sisters who are all one together with and we wish them, Hashem protect them all and the hostages be released, and this finally bring to Nasati Shalom Ba'aretz complete peace in Israel and the entire world. This program is in loving memory of Miriam Bas Eliyahu Altes, Allah Shalom, and Emerita Baruch bin Yaman ben Menuchalana. Altes, Yukusil ben Lei Rachlan Rachel Bas Liba Farkash, dedicated by Pinchas Tadris ben Miriam and Sarah Bas Rachel Altes. So, being that it's Hanukkah, Hanukkah Licht, I mean, what could be more apropos, the very idea that light dispels darkness? Chassidus asked the question, since the main miracle of Hanukkah seems to be the war, like we say in Allah Nisim, there's even Nuschoiz where it says Allah Mulchamas, and that Nasata Gibedim Biyad Chaloshim, and the war that they fought, the Greco-Syrian war against the Eden, and that war was the victory of that war. That's why it says, Bechof, hey, Kislev was the end of the war, and after that came the rededication of the temple of the Beis Amikdosh, Chanukas HaMizbeach, Chanukas HaMenedech, that's why it's called Chanukah, and they found that one crucible of oil that was pure, Shem and Zayazor, that was protected with the chesme from the Kayin Gadol, with the seal. And that then burned. That was one miracle. And the next miracle, that it burned eight days. So why is the mitzvah of Hanukkah, my Hanukkah, the Gemara says, captured in lighting the candle? That's already an outgrowth of the victory of the war. And there were other benefits that came out of it. The continuing service in the Beis Amikdash and so on. So Chassidus answers because the Mulchama, the Teichen of the Mulchama, was around Ner Mitzvah Vitera Er. It wasn't a war like the Levush writes, a war by Purim. The war was Haman, was wanted to kill, Anoshim, Noshim Betaf, God forbid. But by Chanukah, the Mulchama was a Chana Ruchnis. Ner Mitzvah Vitera Er. The Greeks didn't have a problem with Teda or with mitzvahs. But why Teda Secha? Why Chukid it say Necha? Teda, academic wisdom, philosophy, ideology, theology, mitzvahs, morality, ethics. But why are you associating with God? They were fighting against the Gedushas. The idea that we're connecting to something greater, not just the human mind and human morals. And that's also the symbolism of Shemen, pure olive oil. That's why Dafka pure. It's not just enough to blight the menorah. It should be pure. It should be Kodesh, the Torah. It should be connected to something greater than us, to Hashem himself. That was what their war was. So therefore, it wasn't incidental. The very war was around Ner Mitzvah Terer. So how? Does the victory celebrate it through Ner Mitzvah Terer by lighting the candles, the flames? That teaches us in our times, as the question, what lessons do the lights of Hanukkah offer us? In this time of war, is we're fighting a war now too, like they fought a war that. This war, unfortunately, is also is dealing with life and death, not just Ruchnis. But there's also the Ruchnis Dika part of it. Like every war. We're fighting for what Eden represents, what Eretz Yisrael represents. So there are many lessons that you can learn from Hanukkah in connection to this war. The first thing is that we need to know that as dark as the enemy is, as demonic as their hate is, our light and our love and our connection to Hashem is deeper and stronger and more passionate. And indeed, even a little light dispels darkness, how much so, more so a lot of light. So while we fight the war, we have to recognize that while we're fighting it, there's also the light that we bring into this world, the Kiddush Hashem, 
Look what's going on today. You see how in the coming together, Jews who seemingly felt they had no connection, traveling to Israel, supporting Israel, coming to shuls, wanting to know what they can do. The Ner Mitzvah Tere Er has never been so powerful. And it all came from darkness that began Ashmini Atzera Simchas Tere this year. Which, interesting, has a connection to Hanukkah. We know the eight days of Hanukkah correspond to the eight days of, of, of uh, Sukkot, seven days, and then the eighth day Shmini Atzeres, when it happened. So Shmini Atzeres is associated with Hanukkah, especially with the end of Hanukkah. The eight days, the eight days. To the point, according to Shammai, Be'i Shammai, that you lied the Meneda going from eight down to one, like Pori HaChag. What's the Pori HaChag? The bulls that were offered the Be'i Samidish went from 70 downward. Every day, the number of bulls that offered were less. Peich is The Allah is like Be'i like Be'i Hillel, that, uh, that you lied, Ma'elim B'Kedesh, you, every day grows from one to eight. But it just shows you the connection between then and Hanukkah. So now we have Hanukkah that's helping us deal with that darkness. And what way? Light. And light is always more powerful than darkness. But we have to hold on to it. B'Shem Hashem. Nigdil. Eil Berech Eil Basrusim. But we hold on to God. Exactly what the Greeks did not want. They wanted it to be human. No, it's the Hashem within it. Teresecha. So that's lesson number one. And there are many other lessons as well. Bottom line is that we are fighting a war of offense, not just defense. The defense is necessary to eradicate any evil, just like it was necessary during the time of Hanukkah. But what do you celebrate? You celebrate the Ner Mitzvah Tereir. And that will be the ultimate victory. More light, more Kedusha, more holiness, more Tereir, more Mitzvahs. What do we learn? The next question. What do we learn from the length of time when the Hanukkah lights must burn? Which says, Ad, it says, Mishatishka Achama, when the sun sets, Ad, Shatichla Ragle de Tarmadoi, until the feet of the Tarmadoi, which are the peddlers, Seize. What does it mean, seize? That they stop peddling. And that's the time when the Hanukkah lights, that's the length of time. It's a sign, it's the end of the day, and people are no longer in the streets. Let's add another question. What do we learn from the fact that you, that's the, that's the time of lighting the Hanukkah. Then there's the location. Al Pesach Beise Me Bachutz, by the door of your house, going outward. And both these elements are connected. You see here that Hanukkah lights, the emphasis is dafka at night when the sun sets to the point where the feet of the peddlers cease to, cease to walk. And al-pesach beisim ebachutz, outward. Beis HaMikdash, the menera, which Hanukkah originates from, it's coming to it's rededicate that menera, was lit inside. It wasn't the al-pesach beisim ebachutz. <coughs> yes, shkufi matumi, the windows were now in the, in the inside and wide on the outside to bring the light out. But it still was not by the door of the Beis Amidash. It was inside the Kedush, the Holy. And it was lit in the morning. Opinion that it was lit in the evening, but it was mainly not by Hanukkah, it's Dafka in the evening. Because Hanukkah indicates on transforming darkness. So what's the Rigel of the Tarmadoy? So Chassidus brings from Emek HaMelech. The Tarmadoi, which means peddlers, is also the letters Meredes, those that rebel. That you light the Hanukkah to the point that you pierce the darkness, you transform the darkness, till Tichla, you eliminate. Not just it seizes, you eliminate the, le- the legs of those that rebel. All those forces that rebel and are hostile to the divine, to godliness, you eliminate with Hanukkah lights. And even Ziegler Tarmadoi, meaning not just their minds, but their very beings, even their very actions, down to the legs, the lowest part. So all that is part of the Hanukkah message of transformation. Transformation, especially in times like this, when you see 
the forces that rebel against God, that rebel against Kedusha, that rebel against holiness, against goodness. So Hanukkah is coming to eliminate and ultimately transform. Okay. We also know there's a minig to use a dreidel on Hanukkah. The truth is, in Chassidus, Chabad doesn't talk about it. The Rebbe makes reference to it in some places. The Bnei Yisachar, the Bnei Yisachar does talk about it, as do other Sfarim. The Rebbe is in it, how, what, what it means. Nez Godel So that's the four letters on the dreidel, the, the Nun, Gimel, Hey Shin. And the main reason they say, there are many different reasons, that in the time of the Greco Syrians, they had a decree that Eden shouldn't learn Tera. So when they came around and the children were learning Tera, they would, they would, they would uh, conceal their learning and they would play dreidel to deceive and make sure that the enemy did not know what they were doing. So dreidel became a minig. Some people connect dreidel to Mashiach. So someone asked the question. Is there a connection between the dreidel and Mashiach? Most specifically, the significance that the letters on a dreidel, Nun, Gimel, Hei, Shin, are the same gematria as Mashiach. When you add it up, 358. What is the connection between spinning a dreidel and Mashiach? So even though, as I said, the Chassidus Chabad doesn't talk about it, but it's still a mini Yisrael. So a different explanation is given for it. Mashiach comes, there'll be the transformation of everything, like we spoke, the darkness. So Mashiach and Hanukkah are connected in that sense. Also the Shemayin and Nesiche Adam, the seven uh, uh, anointed ones. And um, Shemayin and Yomim. Eight is always a symbol of transcendence, of Mashiach. Seven is a symbol of the structure of existence. And Shemayin is a symbol of Geula that will be beyond Shem and Sahek of the number eight, which goes beyond Hanukkah. <coughs> so as such, we say, Nez Godel Ho Yesham, and that place, Sham, as the Lakut the Tate explains, Sham means there. It refers to Malkam of Klippus. That even Sham, Nez Godel Ho Yesham, you're bringing Kedusha and Alakus everywhere. So that's one of the explanations between the connection. What is relevant to our time is Nez Godel Ho Yesham, Biyomim Mehem, is Manazah, that it should be exactly the same thing today, be transformation and the total conquering of the enemy and the celebration of light like never before. And in practical terms, it simply means that every Hanukkah, of course, we do with great passion and great simcha and joy. But this year, it should be a special emphasis, both in private, the menedas in our homes, and also the public menedas. The Rebbe said, the Pesum a public menedas, shows the whole world, including the non-Jewish world. The Kedusha, the, the, the light of a Hanukkah menedas that publicizes God's miracles. May they be in a revealed way, in a complete way, in our Yisrael and everywhere in the world. Okay. Dreidel and Mashiach. Let us continue some more Hanukkah. Who was Antiochus and why did he have a problem with the Jews doing Teir and Mitzvahs? So we have some information in Chazal, but we also have, there's a Sefer called, the Sefer Amak, the Maccabees, Swarim that are called Swarim Chitzenim, they were not canonized. There's also Megillus and Antiochus. The Rebbe spoke about in Hanukkah Tov Shinun. Why Megillus Esther became canonized and became part of the Chavdal at Sifri Kedish, the 24 holy books of, of Nach, of Ksuvim. And um, Hanukkah never became part of the answer is that because Hanukkah travels to places even outside the Kisve Kedish, meaning outside of holiness, into the darkest of the dark. So there, there's discussion about Antiochus and the different Xedas. So it's not official material, and some of it is not necessarily always accurate. But we do get a sense of what the Greek or uh, Syrians were about, and Antiochus especially with his ego and arrogance. So when he thought the Jews were rebelling against him, he attacked them. And that's when the Maccabees rose to respond. So he represented essentially, like I described before, the Snagdus the opposition to everything that's holy. That's why they went to desecrate the temple. And they brought, they brought unkosher animals and they did everything possible to desecrate and defile, including the oil. 
That's what Antiochus represented. And you found it throughout history. Our enemies who, they attack our Kedusha, they attack, maybe subconsciously, they know that our power comes from Tehidah and Mitzvahs. That was Antiochus. Our response to him is the response of all, anti-Semites, all anti-Semites. Not only will we not cower in fear and retreat, we'll become even more committed. And not only that, it leads to a holiday called Hanukkah, just like Pari gave us the holiday called Pesach. So our enemies gave us the holiday called Hanukkah. Had they not defiled and desecrated the Beis Amigdash and the Menedah, we wouldn't have this. Haman gave us Purim. So we turn everything into a tremendous positive and a tremendous light. That's the lesson. And this is also applicable to the situation, what is going on today in Ezra Yisrael, the same message. Okay. <clears throat> so now there's a bunch of questions came in regarding, I mentioned before, the Machlekes between Shammai and Hillel, how you light the Menorah. Meisiv v'helech or peches v'helech. Hillel says, you go, you light one candle the first night, two the next night, all the way till the eighth is eight. Mailam b'kedush. Shammai says you go the other way around. You start with eight candles, you go down seven, six, like pari hachag, which is peches v'helech, goes downward. One of the explanations is because the l'shitosehu, the l'shitose of Shammai and Hillel, we find in other places also that Hillel generally went according to Basar Poyal, so in actuality, and, and Shami went according to Basar Keach, what was the potential? So by Hillel, you go actually, the first night is one candle. That's the, that's the actual. The second night, two, exactly as it was Hanukkah. By Shammai, the miracle was that right away in the first day encompassed all the, the miracles of all eight days. So celebrate that immediately. Actualize that potential by lighting eight. Aloch is like, like, like Hillel. That's why we say one of the Rosh Tevis of Hanukkah, Ches Neiris, Vahaloch Kibes Hill, Ches Nun Vav, Chof Hei. So, a few questions that came in. What is the spiritual difference between Shammai and Hillel's opinion and how to light the Hanukkah candles? Hillel's opinion makes sense. We want to say we should add in holiness every day. But how do we explain Shammai's opinion? So Chassidus at some Chassidic and other places speak about this. Both of them are obviously El Ve'elu Divelekim Chaim. Both are words of God. Halach is like Hilo. It's also interesting. Hilo is from the word Behilu Nere. The candle that shines. That's bright. Because as I just explained, sometimes Kosher Kayach has a very big power. We don't have to wait till the eighth day to get all that power. As soon as the first day comes, you have all that power. So it really comes down to a different or two approaches in, in, in Kedusha, in Aveda. One is, at times, you begin with a surge. Like, you know, when you start something. For example, actually, a Chanukah Sabayis. Chassidus brings that when you dedicate a home. Or it's like when you bring a child to school. The first day, you give it a gift. You launch it. It's a launch. So when you start something, you do it with a task. Other times, you begin step by step, and the task comes at the end, at the conclusion. Each has a merit. So Shami and Hill each have a merit. That's one of the spiritual differences. And Aveda is also, at times, at the beginning of your Aveda, you really want to give it all. At times, ma'at ma'at agashenu, you go slowly, slowly to integrate it. So it really comes down to two approaches, and they're not a contradiction. Each has their quality, each has their virtue. When you look at the reason, Ma'alim B'Kedesh means that Kedusha, you always have to grow. That's what Sha- the Hillel emphasizes. Shammai emphasizes like Pari HaChag. Pari HaChag, you go lower, 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 because in the beginning you bring all the offerings and the bulls, all of them, and then you slowly diminish. It's a different type of birur. It's the birur of the Cheshech in a way that you first attack all of it, and then you go down to get rid of the last remnants. Hillel is talking about Kedusha. Focus not on the dispelling of the darkness, but on elevating and about celebrating the light. So, Mile and Bekadesh, you grow. So, when you're dealing with Choshech, you have to deal with the Choshech. The darkest is the beginning. 
So you give it all you have, a full, a full assault, full uh, onslaught against the enemy. Whereas when you're doing with light, the light goes step by step, Mylan Bekadish. Okay. So now the follow up question to that is why don't we light two separate menaeus to cover Shame and Hillel's opinions? Some people put on two or even four pairs of film to cover all the major different opinions in the order of the pastors. Why don't we light two separate menaeus to cover Shame and Hillel's opinions? Well, with the film, the main part of the film is Rashi. Then those we put on also Rabbi Natam. Then there's, of course, Shemusha Rabbe and uh, all four pairs. The Rebbe put on all four pairs of the film. By Tfilin, it's Hamshach, it's Hamech, and Emidus, and it speaks in Svarim, and the Rebbe brings it also in the early Sikhs, the Friedrich Rebbe told him to put four pairs of film, what each one has meaning behind it. Actually, the last two don't have a shell, a shell yad, it's all the shell rush is the difference. So, when it comes to Meneira, you're dealing with a mitzvah, you don't do a mitzvah twice. There, it's one mitzvah, mitzvah film, and then you at the end of Davini, you put on another pair of film. Here, what would be here? You make twice the bracha? You don't make twice the bracha. That's on a very basic balbatisha level. On a deeper level, halacha kebeis hillel means halacha kebeis hillel. There, it doesn't say halacha is like one or the other. Rashi is Rabbi Ashi, Rabbi Natam, and the other two, which most of us don't do. You need to have special kedusha saguf. By Hanukkah, you're dealing with one mitzvah, and the mitzvah is for all Eden, so it has to be something that is f- applicable to all. So everybody falls ill. To add a shamai, another approach where you light eight, think of it, you're lighting eight candles and you're lighting one candle the same night. It doesn't make sense. In addition to all the halachic implications of that, you light it at the same time, you light it afterwards. But on a deeper spiritual level, like I said before, it's either this strategy or that strategy. The halacha is to go step by step, mile and bekedish. So therefore, in halacha, there's no room for the other behavior. In concept, there's a value to that, but not in my appeal. So we don't do two. That would be the most basic explanations. If somebody wants to add to that, I'm happy. Please write in to chassidusupply.com and I'll share that. So now let's go to the next question. Can we glean different military strategies from their opinions. Well, somebody wrote it this way. How would Hill and Shami argue about the best ways to win the war in Gaza if they were both army generals today? Hill would emphasize starting slow with one battalion going in and every day adding more soldiers and equipment until the war is won. Shami would probably order a massive barrage shock and shock and awe attack on day one and then every day remove more soldiers and equipment out of Gaza because there's less and less that has to be done to win. Yeah, you could say that. In more strategy, you do indeed have that. You do indeed have two approaches. And that's one way to put it. Each case, in each battle, in each war, you have to, by case by case, determine what's the best way to go. But you can't do both. Going back to the, the question, can, why not do both? You can't do both. Either you begin with a full barrage, or you begin step by step. The halachi is step by step. That doesn't mean that in Gaza or in other wars you have to go that way. As I said, each case has to be determined according to that given situation. And finally, one more about Shammai and Hill. If Zeis Hanukkah is the true essence of Hanukkah, because Zeis Hanukkah, we say it's the true essence of Hanukkah, being, and it being the brightest day because you have all eight candles, how do we reconcile that with the Shami's opinion that we light only one candle on that day? So first of all, that taki you don't reconcile. That's not Allah Kibay Sil. Not the Kibay Shammai. And the Jay's Hanukkah is the full intensity because you have all. Nevertheless, there's also an Indian that says the first day of Hanukkah also has an element of Zeis. Hanukkah Samiz Bayach. Because it's the beginning. So according to Shammai, you'd say that that element of the brightest begins in the beginning. 
But this concept that you're saying that there's Hanukkah, as in the last day of Hanukkah, Taki is according to the base hill, and that's that. Okay. One or two more questions. about um, do our biblical enemies like Antiochus and Amalek actually manifest today or are they more symbolic? Is Amalek an, an ethnicity or just an evil mindset and anyone who subscribes to that mindset is considered Amalek? So Api Aloha, most feel that Amalek has been erased, the actual Amalek. And that's why the Rambam writes in Sefer HaMitzvah of his that how we make a mitzvah when it's already same thing with Hashkosis, with uh, the Sheva Umes. So he says the mitzvah does not change. It's only the reality change. It doesn't exist. But there's still the Ruchanis of Amalek. Amati is Sophic, Amalek is Kiridus, Kaltkite, apathy. So that sense, that still exists. And that's why we have the mitzvah. Zochres Hashem Oslech Amalek in the Veda Ruchanis. Can you say that, that when you find enemies, whether it's Hamas or others, that that's a manifestation or a reincarnation of Amalek? That you need to be an authority to say that. If a Rebbe says that, it's one thing. Do they have elements of it? Absolutely. But I wouldn't put it necessarily in a halachic way that if you destroy that enemy, it's like Mechir Samolik, the mitzvah says of Mechir Samolik. Which, of course, leads us back to Mashiach. Because Mashiach comes, we know the three mitzvahs the Melech, Mechir Samolik, and, um, th- th- and, and, the, and going into Eretz Yisrael. So the Melech. So you could say that Mechir Samolik leads to being able to bring back Melech, to, re, to, to Melech Mashiach to be revealed and bring the Geula. So in concept, you could say that all the wars, and we know the last wars, especially with the Bnei Yishmael and Bnei Esav, the Zayat tells us and the Medrash tells us that that is the prelude to Mashiach. So in that context, yes, spiritually speaking. So we learn lessons from all these individuals. doesn't mean necessarily that it's an actual Gilgal, and of course, symbolic, it's more of a hira ruchnis. Everything exists in the ruchnis, the spiritual level. Okay. So let's talk now a bit. Now we talked about Hanukkah. Let's talk about um, the Parsha. This week is Parsha's Miketz. So I think right away you begin the Parsha. You see right away, Miketz Shavashonim. That Yosef who was sold by his brothers into slavery to the Yishmaelites, Yishmaelim, ends up finally in prison after the story with Petifer. And in prison, ultimately, after he interprets the dreams, so the Sarah Mashkim tells Pare, when Pare has these dreams, there's a, there's a Jew in prison that can interpret dreams. And Yosef comes and interprets the dreams for Pare. And it was so brilliant in his eyes that he appointed him viceroy. Like it says, from here he became a godl. From being a Beis HaSurim in prison, he reached godless, which is always a sign that even when we're in a state where it's dark, the Hanukkah message, not only do you get redeemed, but you become a great leader. And that's what Yesod became. The Lord, the years of famine that followed, that followed the years of plenty, is representative of Naraveda as well. There are times when things are going well, prosperous times. There are times of famine, impoverished times. The wisdom of Yosef is that don't take it for granted. Make sure you stock up. Make sure you put aside for the times of in famine that you'll have enough from the times of plenty. Which means when we have brachas, and we have many brachas, we should appreciate them and not just take them for granted and, squ- and squander them. That's one very basic lesson. In general, miketz, the word miketz, so Chassidus explains, is the end, ketz som lacheshech. Again, the end will be placed. Conclusion of cheshech of Golos. And in general, the parsha in general, being the Yisuf is a Mitzrayim, and he's turning Mitzrayim into a superpower, was a birur of this Erev Sa'oris, of this dark part of the world, which teaches us that today, when we're dealing with Gaza, which is not right near Egypt, Mitzrayim. You're also dealing with refining ultimately a dark place, and look what the behavior they have there. Their behavior toward Jews, the behavior toward their own people. So the whole story is really about redeeming and ultimately refining, and if need be, eliminating the darkness 
to transform it into Meitavar, to a beautiful land. Ultimately, that's what Yesav did. So the time that they would be in Mitzrayim, they would be mevadah until the time they would leave and not have to return again. So brief lessons that we can learn from this parsha, and the many more when you start going into the details. But just, just generally, the kate sum lecheshech point. Okay. So that's a good segue to the next question regarding dealing with the enemy. How can we counter all the confusion today? Today the Germans and Japanese are friendly to us, but 80 years ago they were out to destroy. Actually, that's the next question. Let me, let me skip that for a moment. How can, we, how can we counter all the confusion today? When some Arab leaders talk in English to the international press, they speak nicely about wanting to have peace with Israel. But then when they speak in Arabic to their own constituents, they say bad things about Israel and repeat the lies about Israel being an apartheid state. Does Rabbi Jacobson remember that the Rebbe once said that don't listen to what the Arab leaders are saying, but rather listen to what the people are saying in the streets? To add to the question, the confusion, the propaganda war, the different narratives. Sometimes that alone is so demoralizing, how people can believe stories that are completely not real. God forbid saying things like it never happened October 7th. Israel's the perpetrator. There's no quick answer because fools are fools and idiots are idiots. And they're very destructive forces, people that hate us. Poshet anti-Semites, they hate Jews. But we have to still continue to be clear in our own minds, in our own hearts, and share that clarity. What Idnar, what Eretz Yisrael is, the blessing that we are to the world. Those that bless you will be blessed. And to demonstrate the values that the entire world cherishes all came from Avram Avinu, came from Yitzhak, from Yaakov, from Eden, from Teda. That's our response. Those that listen will listen. Some will learn. I can tell you from my own work, you keep doing it with the right persuasive tone and a calm tone, not in arguments and debates. Who never knows? You never know who's listening. You never know who's listening. So that's the general approach. That's how we deal with confusion, like with light and darkness. You keep shining the light, ultimately it will pierce. The fact that some people can hear, that's their problem, not our problem. But we have to keep on doing it because there's enough people in the world that will listen, are confused, and maybe they hear the right thing. They'll say, ah, now I see it, begin to get it. As I said, I've seen that with my own eyes. Okay, so that's the confusion. What can we do to deprogram and re-educate Muslim Arab civilians who are being fed all the time, this propaganda, many of them growing up as children. Ultimately, as I've said a number of times in this program, we have to re-educate. There has to be a demand. You know, in Germany, after World War II, they re-educated their people to the ills and the evils of anti-Semitism. Doesn't mean they eradicated it, but they made it illegal. From the top down. And what to teach in the schools, the curricula, that's what you do. Here, too, ultimately, you're going to need to do that. I know but nobody wants to mix into a sovereign state and what they teach, but that's what has to be our demand because every day you're producing more haters. And we have to demand that. We're not demanding them to become non-Muslims. Let them be Muslims and be Arabs, whatever you are, but to live up to the highest standards of what God wants of us. And then, can we trust the enemy? Now you can't trust the enemy. That's why they're an enemy. They lie. They're deceitful. We just came from Bukhtas Kislev and we sang Anshe Domim, Mirma. Anshe Mirma. People that have shed blood and Mirma full of deceit. And we need the Padre Vashalom Nafshi from that. Yedir Samach Chetzirufur. Don't deceive yourself. You need to know that. That's also clarity to know who your enemy is. And that too is becoming very obvious. Which brings me to the person who wrote out the question more in detail, but I began reading earlier. Today the Germans and Japanese are friendly to us, but 80 years ago they were out to destroy us. What changed? And what can be done to deprogram and re-educate any Palestinian civilians that survived the Gaza-Hamas war so that in 80 years 
they could be our friendly neighbors instead of enemies sharing our destruction. So I answered that question just earlier. We hope it shouldn't be 80 years. We hope it should be much faster. And we have to accelerate the process as fast as possible. In this upside-down world, someone writes, where men can pretend to be women and the world accepts it, in this era of lies, where there are videos made by Hamas themselves documenting their atrocities, and the world still won't condemn them, why can't I walk into a bank and identify as the owner and take all the money and walk out? Yeah, that's the problem. That's what confusion does. This goes back to the confusion issue. A confusion of morality, of boundaries, of right and wrong, a lack of moral compass. The only real answer to that is, the war against that is to not be that way yourself. To be even a more powerful moral compass. And to speak up and make people aware. A little light dispels a lot of darkness. Because at the end of the day, ignorance, like darkness, is an absence of light. Ignorance is an absence of knowledge. So we need to bring that knowledge. Now there are stereotypes and biases and prejudices that are built in that have already become ingrained in people's so that's what we have to fight in battle. But the way to do it is bring as much light as you can. Okay. Since we're talking about influence on people, so someone asked me, but the, can we ask Rabbi Jacobs to talk about his meeting with the Argentinian president, Javier Millet? Is he a nice guy? Was he friendly and down to earth? It is obvious to Javier Millet that he was a long shot to win, and it was the Rebbe's brachas that helped him win. What are some of the things you discussed outside, aside from politics? Did he eat any oil cookies and did he say if he likes them as much as we do? Okay. Well, firstly, the Kiddush Hashem of it is tremendous. Argentinian president, country, a large country, 47 million people coming to the oil, thanking the Rebbe and being touched by the Rebbe's teachings. That's my connection with him. I gave him my book, Toward a Meaningful Life in Spanish, a few months ago. He spoke about Chazara, as he has already shared on social media and, and video and t- on national TV. So there's the Kiddush Hashem, a person who has true love for Yidin and true love for Eretz Yisrael. And he has his head screwed on right. He understands where, if you ask him, like, why you gravitate, he said, because this is where values came from. This is where morality came from. And he came to see the Rebbe, because the, to thank the Rebbe, because the Rebbe is the ultimate spiritual leader. He wants to be a leader like that. That's what we talked about primarily. I can't talk about the cookies. You'll have to ask someone else about that. As far as um, uh, Zidane to earth, to me he was very humble when I sat with him. Very um, down to earth, yet grounded. Not about himself. Was listening closely. Interested, learning. And I think his actions speak for itself. And God should bless him. Leiv lochim b'sarim b'yad Hashem, I told him that the heart of leaders is determined by God, that he should be a true leader, not just of his country, but the whole world can use a good voice, a moral voice, a, a vision of life. So I believe it's Hashgach Pratis that he becomes a leader during this time of war in Eretz Yisrael. Is he a perfect human being? I'm sure he's not. I don't know him that well. I'm sure he's going to have plenty of political battles. People don't like change. But God should bless him. He should have the clarity and bring that clarity to his people and to people all over the world. That's what I would like to say about it. And I said that more or less. That was what we discussed about what that vision is like, how to make a better world, how to empower your citizens, not just a political and economic welfare, but also with a vision, with a, a commitment to their calling, to their mission in life. Well, as we're talking already about comments, someone wrote, someone wrote the following. I'll read that. Hi, Rabbi Jacobson. Shalom of Rachel to you and yours, your family and your people. Kola kavod on your tireless and awesome efforts to spread chassidus. In honor of Yutas Kislev and its inherent mandate to spread chassidus, please become a presence on the war room with Stephen K. Bannon and or Charlie Kirk. Real America's Voice News. I tried to do this the other way around by suggesting you myself, but I have been unable to get their contact coordinates. Yes, Shukaya. Well, thank you. Maybe we'll pursue those leads because today we do have the opportunity, the platforms, to reach as many people as possible. Thank you for that vote of confidence. And let us now move on to the next part of this program. Okay. Let's deal with now 
the end story. How does the story end? So we've spoken about this in previous weeks, that the story ending is Mashiach. Not just because we're desperate, we need Mashiach, that's a given. But because all these wars and all the wars through history and everything came down to be mevarer, to, to clarify, to separate, and ultimately to refine the world. So the battles are not just defense to eliminate enemies to, that will kill us, that want to kill us. It's to bring Mashiach to the world, the Gula to the world. So we spoke about this in earlier weeks, right after the war began, if you want to call it that, after Shemina says after Simchas Teda. But I want to, there a lot of questions that came in, and I'd like to address a few of them. Do the prophets foretell current events? The answer is absolutely. In the book of Daniel, in Yeshaya, in Yecheskel, and other places, some of it is more obvious, some of it is more covert, more cryptic, more concealed. But especially when you read the commentaries, you see that they were foretold all the empires to come and all the nations to come and the battles, and especially the last birur of Eden, Esav, B'nai Esav, and Yishmol. I mentioned the Mamorim of the Friedrich Rebbe and Tovshin Tess, of the Rebbe Rashab and Tovshin Samaches, and the Rebbe, different times, and you'll see they all correspond to a world events when Ottoman Empire fell as close to Tofrei Samaches, 1908. Tavshin Tess is right after 1948. And the Rebbe in the early 80s talked about these ideas, the bitter of it, which was the time of Lebanese war and the Intifadas, because the Rebbeim were talking about refining the world, and the last bitter is Yishmol, is Esau and Yishmol. So when you look at the, the, the prophecies, including what we mentioned in Pasha Lech Lecha, Brisbane Absarim, that vision is connected to the nations that would come and the battles to come. The latter, Sulam, the latter that Yaakov saw in his dream is also the empires that would rise and fall, the nations that would rise and fall. And ultimately, the end story is always, Achri Ken Yosef B'Rechush God, like it was by Mitzrayim, Kimet Seischem Eretz Mitzrayim, Aren and Eflay, so to be from this Golas, Achri Ken Yosef B'Rechush God. So the prophets absolutely foretell it. Are we meant to go and comb through the prophets and find out every prophecy? I mean, it's interesting. I go gravitate to the approach that what the Rebbe says, an authority like the Rebbe says, that's something obviously you embrace and you study. The al Kuchmeni we talk about, about uh, the Molech Poras and Melech Harvi and that Tzigiyaz Mangulashem, the Zeir Sev Pasha Ve'era, the Zeir Sev Pasha Molech, and other places that are clearly speak about it. But absolutely, it's there in the prophecies, and that shouldn't be a surprise. <clears throat> so the question, should we be studying these prophecies? That again, I would go to the ones that we know were quoted by the Rebbe, quoted by other authorities in that sense. And you do get, I don't say it takes away the pain, but it gets, you get the bigger picture, the choreography. So someone wrote, which of the books of Nevi'im has the most vivid prophecies about what will happen right before Mashiach comes? Which ones most vividly describe today's events? And should we be reading that book of prophecy now so we can be reminded that all of today's world events through all those seem frightening are part of Hashem's plan and when we realize it, we won't, shouldn't be scared but should be happy that Mashiach is about to come. So I answer that right now just to sum up again. Well, the book of Daniel is very, very... Uh, uh, ap- ap- apropos, as is Yeshaya, as is other Pesukim in different places. I mentioned back in Parshas Neach, we, uh, we, in, when that went in Parsh, I spoke about Parshas Neach, Chomas, Chomas, the word Chomas is used in a play, few places, so there's more the Muslim and something more direct. And should we read it? Look, it's part of Teda, call it Esik B'Teda, Sa'ela, when you Esik in something in the Teda of it, it helps refine it. So in that sense, yes, if it's just for uh, sensationalism, just for voyeurism, just, then it doesn't have value. It has to come down to some Aveda that inspires you to do more Teda, to learn more to, to learn more Teda, to do more mitzvahs, more davening. Okay. Was it in a form of prophecy or were they wise men who could discern patterns and predict the future? They say history repeats itself. Is it possible that our prophets didn't see the future through supernatural means, 
but rather they were an exceptionally smart people, a group of people, that noticed patterns repeating themselves, so they made predictions for the future based on those parents' patterns they noticed. The answer is both. This Chochem Odev Menovi, a Chochem Reyes Hanel, a Chochem, a wise person, can see from the patterns, can anticipate, can connect the dots. But a Novi is actually someone who's prophesizing. God is speaking through him. So God is speaking through him. So it's not just a wise person that foresees. Are there situations where a prophet is speaking like a wise one and not as a prophet? There are cases like that. So both are valuable, but they're two different levels, Chacham and Anovi. When it comes to the events of our times, so there are things that were said as Batur Nevoah, and there are things definitely said to Chacham. Some of the Sikhs of the Rebbe I would categorize as Chachma, where the Rebbe describes that how the world is evolving, the things we see in technology and politics, and we're coming to a point of Mashiach and Geula. And then there were things where the Rebbe may have said Befedish, when he said, you talk of a Shefer Godel during the Six Day War. That's a prophecy. The prophecy is not the Rebbe's, but he's applying that prophecy to our time. So that takes a certain authority. Okay. Can we apply the prophecies in the book of Daniel to our times? The answer is yes. Especially when you look at the commentaries like the Barbanel and some others that describe it in the context of the wars being fought with Evan Ezra, the wars being fought with the Ishmaelim. Others define the book of Daniel, the fought, wars fought with Edem. So there's Edem and Ishmael, and then there's the combination of both. So the answer is yes. Is there anywhere in the Torah that says this war will be called Operation Iron Swords? I can't tell you. I don't know who coined it. The Israeli government obviously coined it. The only posuk I found was in Tehillim, Beis Tess, right in the beginning, where it says, you shall break them with an iron rod, like a potter's vessel, you shall shatter them. So perhaps that's this connection and source. Can this war lead us directly to Mashiach? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, according to some of these statements, it goes right there. The Bala Turim says that when Yishmol Nafal, that will lead to the birth of Mashiach, comes from Yitzchok, tell this Yitzchok. The Medrash Shalkut Shmeni, the Zoya, as I mentioned. So the answer is absolutely yes, as we've discussed at length. And this is like the final push, the final birur, so to speak. There's no doubt our current generation, our current generation, the seventh generation, is fighting a war for the survival of Israel and the Jewish race, someone writes. When King David wanted to build the Beis Amigdash, Hashem said, you can't because you're involved in war. Hashem said, it has to wait for the next generation of King Shlema. How do we reconcile that Hashem won't let a generation involved with war to build the Beis Hamikdash, with the clear statements in Basilegani that our generation, the seventh generation, will bring the Shekhinah back down to our physical world, which means rebuilding the Beis Hamikdash where the Shekhinah dwells? Is it possible Hashem will not allow Mashiach in our generation because we are involved in a war? And if Hashem is okay with sending Mashiach in our generation, even though we are involved in a war, then why would Hashem not allow King David to build the Beis Hamikdash? I'm not really sure what the question is. I just read it because I try to honor everybody and respect everyone's questions. It says because Damrav, there was blood on his hands, he fought wars, and Hashem did not let him to build the Beis Amigdash. But he prepared the ground, and Mishlema, his son, did build the Beis Amigdash. We are fighting defensive wars. Pekoach Nefesh. That's not something in the same situation. And also, we're thousands of years later, and the Geul is right on the threshold. We know that. So to say that these wars are in a way Chaz Rashaun, punk the opposite, the exact opposite. The Muhammad are actually preparing for the Gaul. That's what I would say. Okay. If Mashiach came today, will we still have murderous enemies? 
Will the war automatically be over or would there still be evil, murderous people resisting and making problems? And then Mashiach would have to go and bomb the smiles over their faces. Now Mashiach comes, then that ends all the enemies. Either they're eliminated or they're transformed. That you need to know. And then a bunch of other questions came in about when Mashiach comes, will all Hamas members, include the pro-Hamas protesters all over the world, be brought to justice and hang from a tree a hundred cubits high, just like a Haman and his evil ten sons? I can't tell you whether it'll be like that, but definitely Mashiach is bringing Gedusha into the world. And that's what we need to know. Will Mashiach have supernatural powers to destroy our enemies? Hello, Rabbi. We were taught that the Mashiach has to be a human being and not an angel. Our question is, will the Mashiach be a human with supernatural physical powers? Will he be able to fly around the world and stop pogroms with his bare hands? Will he be able to go to college campuses and smite woke liberals who are calling for killing the Jews? Well, no, that's not what Mashiach does. Mashiach is Gilead the Kus in this world. When there's Gilead and the Kus, automatically all this disappears. So I understand you think of it in very, very physical terms. We have to do what we have to do now. When Mashiach comes, it'll be a world like the Rambam says, I mean, there are different Kufas. But that's what you have to remember. When it says, Some say it's a spiritual war. We don't know what the exact war it's indicating. But I think you have to get out of your mind that idea that Mashiach is coming to destroy Hamas. That's not the idea here at all. Hopefully, with Hashem's help and Hashem's blessings, the Tzahal will do that. Okay. But I understand the temptation because of all our anger and all our grief. We want Mashiach to come finally and finish this whole mess. I got it. Okay. So let us now move on to who owns the land of Israel. How do I respond to people who claim that, is that Israel is occupied Palestinian land? Well, firstly, you have to educate yourself and inform yourself. Open up a chumash. And read, read in Parsha Lech Lecha, whose land is Israel? God gives it to Avram, he promises it to him. Avram indeed even buys parts of the land. Open up the Rashi on the first Pasuk in Chumash, and he says, why does the Torah begin with Grace with Bar Lakim? And not with HaKhedi Sadar Lechem, the first mitzvah? Because there'll be a time where Goyim will say, list him at them. you stole it, exactly this question. You stole this land from us. So Hashem says, I'm beginning the Torah that I created heaven and earth. So say to them, Koyach Maisev Higil Ame. Los Yislam Nachlas Goyim. The Ebishti Koyach Maisev. I created the world. I gave it to the nations. Then I took from them a piece and gave it to the Jewish people. So it's yours. And history, long before there was Muslims long before they were Christians, long before they were Arabs, long before they were others, the Jewish people lived in Israel for many years. And they built a first temple and built a second temple. And we still pray in that direction. It's the center of our lives in every possible way. And we remember it. Never to forget Jerusalem, never to forget Israel. Spiritually, it's the vortex and Mashiach comes, all of us will return there. Now there are millions of Yidin there, Baruch Hashem Ken Yirbu. The burden of proof, someone should ask us, is a pure chutzpah. Everyone else are occupiers. When the Jews went down to Egypt because of the famine, their neighbors went and moved in. And when the Jews came back, they didn't want to give it up. Then the Babylonians, the Assyrians, and then the Babylonians attacked Israel and expelled the Jews. Then the Romans in the second temple. And throughout history, that's our story. Who are the occupiers? It's ridiculous. We're the residents, indigenous nation that belongs there. The natives, yes. Have others lived there? Yes, that's fine. 
and this was not kicking anyone out. But it's just a pure, I, I, I don't even know what to say. Historically, biblically, religiously, whatever you want to. And if you don't know enough of it, study. The fact that Jews left, they were sent out, and, but then they continued to come back to their homeland. And if the Arab world, the Muslim world, would lay down their arms and stop calling for Israel's destruction, they would have total peace. And they could thrive as well as many Arab Israelis do in that, in that country. Okay. Thank you and Yeshekayach on all the videos you have done and are doing. They are much needed in today's world. I wanted to ask you a question, Ri Rashi on Bereshis 1.1. Everybody talks about it. It was only when I heard you say that it meant Hashem gave the land to us originally that it helped. Why? Because when I read the Rashi, it seemed indefensible to the atheists who say people do things in God's name all the time. Here's my question. If you look at Rashi 9.26 and 12.6, that's in, uh, in Sefer Bereshis, says, Noyach gave the land to Shem. Then it says the Canaanites was in the land, meaning they conquered it. This leads me to believe that when Joshua and Israel went into the land, they were reconquering it. We know from our Mercedes that Hashem thought of Israel before creation. The land was designated for us before the creation of the world by the Creator. This information helps me. It gets only fret, I only get I get only frustrated with Rashi on one one because it seems so easily dismissible by our enemies, Chaz Rashal. No disrespect, disrespect, disrespect to Rashi intended. What do you make of this? Why don't more people talk about Rashi nine twenty six and twelve six? Sincerely. And the answer is, by all means, we should talk about it all. But the Rashi, the first Rashi, or the Rashi in the first Pasuk, obviously is the most blatant, because it says clearly the argument that it'll be, that you'll say we stole it, list him. But by all means, you should use the other sources as well. I don't see a reason why you shouldn't. We talk about Avram and so on. And that all the other verses that talk about the promised land, and all the Sukkim, how the Eden are traveling through the wilderness to the promised land, and live there and enter there, and I may should pray to go into the promised land. I mean, all of it builds into a tremendous case, and by all means, we should definitely use it all. Okay. Let us see what else we can cover here. There's so many different topics, but at least I'm getting through some of them. So let's do another one or two on this topic as well. Does the Torah document Abraham purchasing land in Israel to preempt others' claim to the land? Okay. There are many parts of the, of the lives of the patriarchs that the Torah doesn't record. Maybe the Torah felt it was not important for us to know. We don't know how and where Avram and Sarah met and fell in love and decided to get married. We don't know some of their daily hobbies that they enjoyed. None of Sarah's challah recipes are recorded. But when Sarah passed away, the Torah could have just simply said she passed away, but it goes into great detail, describing how Avram met a landowner named Ephron, who offered him the cave of Machpelah for free as a gift to bury Sarah in, but Avram refused the gift and said he preferred to pay the full price of 400 silver shekels for the value of the land and that they signed a contract deed for the transaction. Is it possible that Torah felt... These details were important to include, so in the future, if anyone tried to say you stole the land, Avram and his descendants could show a valid contract that he bought the land. Can we today use this story in addition to the story of Hashem promising us the land to prove we are the rightful inhabitants of Israel and not the Palestinians? Absolutely. And that is indeed one of the things that we can use, among many, many others, if that needs to be the case. Remember, there are people who are not interested in hearing anything. But those are looking for the truth. The story is endless. I mean, I could sit here for hours, for days, for years probably, to build a case. The mere fact that we even have to do so is ridiculous. The most best-selling book in, on earth forever. The Bible says it. You don't want to accept it as a religious document, a historic document. And it wasn't written yesterday. And it's the basis of Christianity and the basis of, Muslim, of Islam. It says it there. Okay. (coughs) 
So let's conclude this, this special program on Hanukkah with something again about Hanukkah and about a positive note. Because at some point you feel like almost, I don't know, you feel polluted by even engaging in these conversations. They have to be engaged because people are so ignorant and there's so much misinformation and disinformation. But let's remember this. That Ramban writes, the beginning of Parsha Baal Eishcha, that even though the Meneda Hanukkah is actually comes to rededicate the Meneda of the Beis HaMikdash, which was a Ner Tamid, a Ner Tamid, it burned forever. But then the Beis HaMikdash was destroyed, so those flames were extinguished, the Gashmis at least. Abraham Halalu, these flames of Hanukkah, Einan Ptelu Le'elam, they will never be eliminated. They will never be extinguished. As we see, even throughout Golis, Hanukkah, even the darkest times, even the Holocaust, to light that little flame. One, two, three, all the way to eight. It's a tremendous lesson in resilience, in the indestructibility and the, of the Nitzchias of Am Yisrael. Ani Hashem leishanisi u'bnei Yisrael leichalisam. So when you look at the Hanukkah lights, and the Friedrich Rebbe tells us, to listen to what the candles tell us, they tell us a message of forever. We were here, we are here forever. We have outlasted our, outlasted our enemies, both in the Hellenistic times during the Greco-Syrian wars of Hanukkah, before that Purim, before that the Egyptians, the Babylonians, for that, the Assyrians, the Romans, the Byzantine, the Ottoman, the Spanish, and we are here. That alone gives such a tremendous strength that we will prevail. We want it to be with the least amount of pain, with the least amount of darkness. But Hanukkah demonstrates once and for all and forever and ever the superiority of light over darkness. So let us embrace that light. Let us emulate it. Let us become walking menorahs, walking lights. Wherever we go, people say, wow, here shines an exemplary example, a living example, a shining model of what a divine human being should be, a human being created in divine image what God wants of us. That's how we should be today. That's the call of our times. And that is something nobody can deny or resist. And may that example affect those that watch it and those that see it. To be a light unto nations, a light. Light. Until the point where this light will shine from one corner of the earth to the other the light of our heroes, our brave heroes, fighting on the front lines to sacrifice themselves, to defend and protect the innocent men, women, and children of all, of everywhere. And that light will spread from Israel to the entire world until we come to a world filled with light of the divine. No more evil, no more destruction, my entire mountain, holy mountain. The entire world, because the world will be filled with divine knowledge as the waters cover the sea. Amen. Kenyi Ratsan. Happy Hanukkah. Frenacha Hanukkah. May the light of Hanukkah bring us the light of the Beis Amidish Ashlishi, relight the Meneda there, and forever and ever will be Shalom Nitzchi. Migdash Adne Kenyi Yodecha. This is Chesidus, My Life Chesidus Applied. We're here every Sunday, 8 to 9 p.m. Freilich and Chanak, Freilich and Tamid. May the Eden and Eretz Yisrael and Eden everywhere be protected. May the world only experience peace and, and, and without any aggravation and any pain. Only good news, the, the news of the Gula Hamitiz Vashlema. This program is brought to you by My Life Chesidus Applied. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at chassidusapply.com slash donate.